Alrighty, Sandy, here we go. We're on video number three, which is starting Revelation chapter two. Um, if you hear some weird ambient noises in the background or something, um, our air conditioning unit outside decided some of the parts on it would play out, and so therefore we actually have the doors open right now. Of course, we have screens and windows up and things like that, you know, and letting some of the cooler air from outside in tonight and uh, that type of thing. So if you happen to hear crickets chirping or something like that, don't think that I'm trying to go sleep on you or anything. <laughs> I'm just uh, <clears throat> just trying to stay cool a little bit. But um, all right, we're in chapter two of Revelation. And I'm gonna start in verse one, of course. And let's see how far the Lord will let us get. I'm trying to keep these videos, like I said, to around 30 minutes. So if that's too long, if you when you watch this, if that's too long for you, then let me know and I'll cut it down. If it's not long enough, if you want me to go longer, I can, but I was, I was thinking 30 minutes would be pretty good. But anyway, all right, chapter two, verse one. We're starting into the seven churches now. I wanna say this before we get into this. Um, keep this in the back of your mind for the next two complete chapters, chapter two and chapter three. There are seven distinct churches and those seven distinct churches were real churches during the time that John was writing this down they were just like whatever churches might be up in your area they were real places that people went to worship the Lord when um, when this was being written down that being said spiritually speaking these seven churches also represent seven time periods throughout history all right, again, now the third time, remember I was talking about that in threes, God working in threes. These seven churches also represent seven time periods of the church age. The church age started at Pentecost in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit fell and the 3,000 were saved and it will continue on until the fulfillment of the Gentiles, which is the last Gentile or lost person that lives on this earth is saved. At that time, at that moment, the church age will be cut off and it will end. Okay? So just keep that in your mind as we're reading this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks now interestingly he Jesus immediately tells us first church the same thing that's in verse 20 of the last chapter seven stars are the angels or the ministers and the seven candlesticks being the church church is okay the first church here is Ephesus and I'm, I'm reading from my notes when you see me look down like this if, if I'm not just talking to you it's because I'm reading my reading my notes I'm sorry about that but um verse 1 chapter 2 up first is Ephesus to receive their judgment. Jesus wastes no time letting them know that he holds their lives, souls in his hand, and he is the head of the church. See, we have to understand something. God is God and we are not. I, I say it so many times, but we have to go a little bit deeper there. When I say God is God and we are not, I'm not just referring to the fact that he is our deity, that we worship and we're just human. What I'm referring to is that God is the ultimate and final say-so in everything that happens. So if God wanted to, now God is not going to do it because he keeps his promises unlike man so many times. God is, God is going to stand on his word. He's not going to change his mind on his divine sovereign will. And his divine sovereign will is that those of us like me and like you that are born again, washed in the blood, that we are saints of his, all right, his desire that pleases him and his perfect will has established that we will reign with him forever. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing is going to take us out of his hands. Nothing is going to remove us from the Lamb's book of life. Okay. Now that being said, if, if, I'm just, I'm just using this as a hypothetical. Okay. If God wanted to, God could still say, because he's God, that I'm going to destroy everything. Okay. That doesn't mean that he's going to remove our souls from his hand. He's done promise that. But God could still say at this moment, if he wanted to, I've decided that I'm going to blow the earth up. 
you know, like a big atomic explosion or whatever. The whole earth's just going to be blown up and everything on it is going to die at that moment, physically die. If God wanted to do that, he could do it. You know, he, he's God. We're not, okay? That doesn't mean he is. That doesn't mean he will. But that just means that he can. All right. He is telling these people, listen to this again. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Who are the seven stars? The ministers. Now, what do the ministers do? The minister's job is to preach his word or to deliver the message of his word unto the flock, unto the sheep. Okay? No man cometh to the Father but by him. Who is him? He is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. If you look in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word dwelt among men and took upon flesh. Okay, Jesus is the Word. Excuse me. There's something flying around in here. Wow, I wasn't spending that in your I bet you thought I was having some kind of fit. It was not the Holy Spirit, it was a bug, I promise you. But um, Kimberly will get a good laugh at that, I bet. But um, <laughs> I don't know what I look like on there. Forgive me for laughing. I'm, I'm not trying to turn this into a co comedy hour. I'm just, I just can't help it. It was funny. Um, but anyway, back to this. He holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. In other words, he holds the ministers accountable. And he holds. And you remember, the right hand denotes power and authority. Those that he sets up, he holds them to a higher calling. These people were supposed to deliver his message to the flock. Now we're going to start seeing what did they do. Did they deliver the message? Did they do it right? Did they do it wrong? He's going to start expounding on this. You notice at the end of verse 1 he says, Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Those seven golden candlesticks are the church. See, Jesus is always front and center. Jesus is also the cornerstone. Jesus died for the church. All right, Jesus is paramount in the church. If Jesus is not in the church or in your church that you're going to, then you, you need to move from that church. You know, you see what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 2. Now, I'm going to read verses 2 and 3 together because they're connected. I know thy works. He immediately tells them, I know your works. Now, that's very important because he doesn't say, I know your fruit. He says, I know your works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, or tolerate those that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, or to be liars. In other words, these people were proclaiming that they were apostles. All right, now what is an apostle? I'm going to stop right there for one second. I said I was going to read it all, but Lord, let me stop. An apostle is someone who has had a physical revelation of Jesus himself. In other words, the 12 disciples and Paul were apostles because they saw him. They walked with him. They saw him. All right. People, a lot of people today, you'll hear them call themselves apostles. And I'm not saying that they're, that they're being blasphemous or anything like that but technically speaking they're not they're disciples just like me and you okay now we can see the word I mean we have the word you know before us we have his nature we have his creation but we have not physically seen Jesus yet with these eyes so we're disciples but we're not apostles okay but it, he says listen to this you have tried them you know the Bible says try the spirits to see if they be of God or not they tried these people. They claim, these people claimed that they were apostles, and they were not apostles. Okay, they, they were lying. And it says, you have found them to be liars. Now look at verse 3. And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. If you notice one good thing about this, what I just said, good. Everything here is good. Everything that they're doing is is good. I mean, it's all positive. He's telling them the positive things that they have done for him that he is glad that they did. Now we get into verse 4. We'll see what happens. Verse 4 says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat or something, as we would say, against you, because thou hast left thy first love. Now that's an astounding statement. 
they had left, left their first love. Now, who is their first love? That should be very simple. A lot of people debate it. The first love is Jesus himself. A person cannot come to the Father but by Jesus. Okay? Not by even reading the Word or not by even saying a fancy prayer. Not by going to a church and getting your name put on a roll. Not by water baptism. Not by good deeds. It's only by Jesus himself. So Jesus is the first step to get to where we need to be in eternity. He is our first love. For God so loved the world, the lost, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, verse 4. Let me read my notes to you. Even with all the good works they were doing, Jesus was still upset with them for leaving their first love, or in other words, not crediting him with their good deeds. They began to believe in their works more than they believed in him. Wow. Don't you see this? I see it all the time on Facebook. People are quick to boast of what people have done, but they're not glorifying God. That's the reason you see me a lot of times say, if anything good comes from me, it's him, and if it's not good, it's me, because that's the truth. There's nothing that I can say to you, no matter how much I mean it from a heart, no matter how much I care or love or anything else, there's nothing that can edify you, there's nothing that can lift you up, there's nothing that can be meat that you can obtain and that can feed your soul unless it's coming from him. And I'm hoping and praying as we do these videos that there is some meat there. I don't know. I hope there is. I mean, I'm just sharing with you what he, he has shared with me. The point being this. How many times do Christians start out on the right path as far as doing for him and laying their selfish sides, their ways and their sides, you know, the parts about them, the selfish, greedy, lustful, all that. They lay it down. And they seem to be going right along. And then all of a sudden they start easing back the other direction. All right. This is commonly known as backsliding. And backsliding happens all the time. If a Christian ever tells you they've never been in a backslidden state, then they are lying and they're in the backslidden state when they're telling you that. Okay. Every person backslides on God. None of us have reached perfection yet. We're heading there, praise God, and we shall obtain that. Paul said that he marched towards the prize, but when was the prize? The prize was not in this life. Paul never reached that prize even up until his beheadment, okay, or beheading, however you want to say that. The moment he laid his head on that block and they chopped his head off, up until his soul left his body, his mortal body, he had not obtained the prize. Now, praise God, that, that quick, that quick. That's an amazing thing to think on. I remember when I was young, I used to ponder death. You know, and of course, being lost, you know, there was a fear there because I, I was thinking to myself, Lord, you know, of course, I wouldn't even call him Lord then. But at the same time, I'd be like, I don't want to die. You know, that scares me. I don't want to die. You know, I, I hear people dying. You know, I'd go to funerals when I was little and, person would be dead, you know, and I'm like, oh my Lord, they're dead. I don't want to die. You know, and that, of course, sounds so childish now. Paul talked about putting off childlike ways and thoughts, and you know, and that that's part of that. Um, yet, at the same time, there's a lot of people today that are walking around dead, and they don't even know it. <laughs> you know, sad to say, but that's just the truth of the matter. But they had left their first love. They had began to credit themselves, you know, with what they had done, you know, instead of giving him all the honor and glory for it. Forgive me if my if I ramble a little bit on this video. I'm actually making this video later. I was on the phone for a few hours talking to a friend and um, it got longer than what I thought. <laughs> but needless to say, I mean, the conversation was great and um, I didn't realize what time it was when I came in here. So my brain might be just a little bit tired, but that's okay. Uh, hey, God's still going to be lifted up in this thing. Jesus is still Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do 
the first works. You notice he did not say fruits. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Now, a lot of times on Facebook, you'll see a lot of people talking about repent. The Bible mentions the word repent. It mentions repenting, repentance, repented. It mentions all these words pertaining to the word repent. But first, we have to establish something. What does repent mean? All right. Now, I'm fixing to get into something here that people do not want to hear and they do not want to accept because... They do not want to have to give total surrender of their lives to the Lord. They want to be able to obtain some part of control in their own life because they feel like they can do something good for Him and be rewarded for it. Okay. Here's what it amounts to. The word repent in the Hebrew tongue literally means this. To ask forgiveness of and to turn from it in doing so. All right, now you'll hear a lot of people say that the word repent means to turn away from and not do again. But there's a problem with that. How many people do you know that never commits a sin? All right, if you know someone that doesn't, I would like to meet them. I would like to shake their hand and hug their neck and kiss them on the cheek and find out what they're doing. I say that because this, if that word really and truly meant to turn away from and never do again, then that means if we repented for every evil act that we do, then we would never do any evil act ever again. In other words, we would become perfect in this flesh, just like Jesus did. Well, that's convoluted logic. If we could become perfect in this flesh that we're in ourselves, then the sacrifice of the cross by Jesus was in vain. He did that for no reason. He would not have had to take all our sins upon him to begin with because we could have crucified those sins ourselves. We could have done it. We would have had no need for him. He could have set up in glory and never had to come down and suffer for us like he did to go through the torment and the hell and the agony that he suffered so that we may have right standing with the Father. Now, I say all that because of this. He's telling these people to remember, therefore, from where you are fallen. In other words, what he's saying is this. What caused you to get to where you are now? Why are you down instead of up? Why are you in the mire instead of on the clay? Why are you away from me when you should be right beside me in this life. Jesus has never moved. You may have seen it sometimes. There's church signs. Every once in a while, I'll see them on a church, outside of a church building, a church sign, and they'll say this. If you feel like God is a million miles away, guess who moved? See, God doesn't go anywhere. The Bible says that he shall never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is right here beside me right now, even though I can't tangibly see him or touch him or, or whatever, that type of thing. It's spiritual. But yet, at the same time, he's here, okay? Now, that's hard to understand because the Bible also says that he is at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf, okay? Waiting to step on the clouds and calls to glory, okay? The reason it's easy to understand, even though it's hard to understand, I'm going around the world here, the Holy Spirit is the one that draws us to him. The Holy Spirit is the one that's here on this earth right now. And I say Jesus is right here, technically it's the Holy Spirit, but the three are the same. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're three in one, the Trinity, okay? They're all the same. They're, they're all working together. They're all one. That You can't take one apart from the other, okay? But he's telling them, you know, what has caused you to get to where you get? Then he says, repent. Now let me read my note to you, okay? And then if God has shown me something else, praise God for it, I'll add. Jesus warned them that if they didn't start putting him first again, you remember they were putting their works first, they were bragging, boasting on themselves, that he would take, what does it say? 
I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick. What is the candlestick? The candlestick that we learned about is the minister. Okay? You notice that. It's the minister. Start putting him first again. He would, re he would take their minister from them. Now, this was a tragedy in the early church. They did not do what churches do today. This is something I wrote down. They did not get a new preacher each month. <laughs> I mean, that's so true. How many churches do you know of that are constantly having a minister come in, minister go out, people come in, people go out, and all that type of thing? But let's go a little bit deeper. That I just wrote that down for my own good, you know, just because I thought, you know, well, that's true. And, you know, I found, I'm not going to lie, I found a little amusement in it because it's sad, but it is funny at the same time because all these people claim that they're just doing the best for God. And, and when, you, when you scrape back, you know, when you take sugar off the top of the cake, you find out that what the ingredients they have are the same ingredients we have. You know, we're all the same thing. We're all we're all either in him or we're not in him, you know, and those of us that are saved, we're still gonna fail because we're still walking around in this. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. In other words, what I was getting at a minute ago is what he's telling them is this. Turn back to me. In other words, take your eyes off of this stuff here. Okay? Start focusing back on me. That's where you were starting to begin with. You know, you were doing all these things, and these things were great. But you got so wrapped up in what you were doing that you quit acknowledging me and started acknowledging the work. Or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will take the minister out of his place unless you repent. In other words, what he's saying is you are being blessed by me putting that minister there. He is feeding you what I'm sending to my servant John to give to you. But if you're going to have it your way and do what you want, then I will remove the minister out of the way and you will not hear this vitally important message that you need to hear. And how many people today in the churches today are not preaching the book of Revelation? They're doing the flock a disservice and not an honor unto him, but a dishonor. Because they're keeping these words that are so paramount, so important. These words mean so much. Let's go to verse 6. But this, but this, talking about the church of Ephesus, this you have, or hast, it means have, but this you have, that thou hatest the deeds. Who's he, who do they hate the, de the deeds of? They hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. All right. Jesus wanted the best for everyone. Okay. So now we see immediately, uh, he started off listing what they were doing good, and then immediately he, he hit them hard. <laughs> you know, he hit them hard in verse 5. We were just talking about verse 5. Now, immediately right behind that, though, he starts building their confidence back up because he tells them, after delivering a sober reminder of where they were spiritually, he starts letting them know exactly what they are doing again that's really good. These people that it mentions, the Nicolaitans, these people were pagans. These people, literal armies that would march in to, well, they would march into towns, and while they were marching into towns, they would take over the churches where they were at. And literally, they were, I don't know what you'd call them. It, it sounds funny to our minds because you can't imagine, you know, why would an army come in and take over a church? But what they were doing is they were trying to preach an agnostic message. And then they were wanting people to turn away from Christ. I've read things um, before, and I can't remember verbatim. But something along the lines that a lot of these people were actually paid by Rome to go in and destroy what was left of the message that Jesus had presented. And so they would, they would march through towns doing that. But regardless, he tells them, he says, but this you have. In other words, wow, you have, you're doing this, and this is awesome. You hate what these people are doing, and I hate it too. So you're standing up for me. Again, going back to this thing, I know your works. You notice he says that in verse 2, I know your works. Then down here in verse 5, 
do the first works. The reason he's not mentioning fruit is because fruit is an inward thing. Works is an outward thing. He's not targeting the fruit here. He's targeting their works. Okay? In other words, he's not coming against them saying, Hey, all you people, y'all are lost and y'all are going to hell. No, that's not what he's doing. What he's saying is, Y'all, your heart is for me. Okay? And you have things that I love about you, but then there's things about you that you don't do that you need to do also. Who does that sound like? If that doesn't sound like the church of today, then then who does it sound like? Spiritually speaking, timeline-wise, the church of Ephesus represented the first four to five hundred years after Jesus. Okay, but let's just say about four hundred years. So from the time of around thirty-one, year thirty-one up to around four hundred and thirty-one. Okay. In that time period, spiritually speaking, this is the church of Ephesus and what they're representing. All right, and I see that it's at 26 minutes, and I usually run 30. Uh, let's go ahead and finish up verse 7 here, and then we'll be moving on the next video to the next church, which is smart. But verse 7, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? Well, what does that sound like? Doesn't that sound kind of familiar to Genesis? If you go back and read the, the account of Genesis with the trees in the garden. Go back and study that sometime if, if you want to. Look it up, especially around Genesis. Look in Genesis 2. Go down to around verse 9 and in those areas. Okay. But let's look at this for a minute. He that hath an ear. Now, un unless there's a physical problem at birth, a birth defect, let's say it that way, everyone is born with ears. So, immediately when he says, he that hath an ear, who is he talking to? He's talking to everyone. He's not just talking to these particular people, even though it's addressed to them. It still means everyone. Why? He says this, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Plural. He's not just talking to the church of Ephesus. Many people think that he is. No, he's not. <laughs> he's covering everybody. Though this minister is at Ephesus, that he's referring to moving out of, this special person that shall relay this message that John is giving, he's talking to everyone that would have a part of him, anything to do with him. But here's the thing. Though everyone is born with ears, and of course spiritual hearing too, not everyone uses it. Sadly, many Christians go through life each and every day and they're not doing what they should do and because they're not listening to him, guess what? Mr. James Beverly right here is very, 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 very guilty. And I'll challenge any person that stands up and says that they're not. Matter of fact, I put, I put to them a challenge but I'll make sure I'm standing at least several states away because lightning is about to strike big time and I don't want to be caught up in that. But seriously though, I know I joke around a lot and I don't mean to take away from the truth here and the, and the seriousness of it. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat. How do we overcome? Now remember this is the church age. There's several different ways of overcoming in the Bible, but this is the church age. We're dealing again, we're dealing from Pentecost to the last time the last Gentile is saved. How do we overcome? What did I just say? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by salvation. We overcome by being redeemed through faith, by grace through faith, for it is not done by works that man may boast. But we are saved by grace through faith. In other words, it's all Him, and that's how we overcome. So anyone that is saved, here's our promise. Here's the first promise. There are seven promises. Here's the first one. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Guess what? Those trees in the Garden of Eden, they're not gone. The Garden of Eden has never disappeared. The Garden of Eden, paradise, is where Jesus is. The garden is Jesus himself. 
when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, and I don't want to get into a whole expose on Genesis, which we could do if you wanted to, but when God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, okay, you know what happened? We're looking at this spiritually, and this is hard for the flesh to understand, but, but here's what happened. The garden was taken at that moment. Adam and Eve's eyes were blinded to the garden, and the garden itself was taken away from man. Mankind had no more part of Jesus because man was no longer redeemed to Jesus. Man had failed. Okay? The garden itself, the literal garden, okay, like trees, shrubs, animals, and all that type of thing, that garden remained up until the flood. Okay? But, 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 the spiritual part of that garden was taken away. If you go back and read the account in Genesis, it says that he set a flaming sword. What is the flaming sword? It's the word of God. And he set cherubim, or cherubim, but he set at the entrance that no man may enter anymore thereafter. And the thing is this. God fixed that. A lot of people will say, well, the Garden of Eden is here or there, or here's where it was and everything. No, it's not there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not there. And the reason it's not there is because if it still was, then that flaming sword and that cherubim that he set there to keep man out would still be there too. He's not going to go back on his promises. Okay, When he said that no more would man enter there, he meant it. But here's the thing. Me and you have already entered it, Sandy. Kimberly, whoever's watching this video, we have already entered it. You know how we've entered it? We've not entered it yet in this state. We will never enter it in this flesh. This flesh has to be changed. It has to be glorified before it can enter it, back into it. Adam and Eve were glorified until they fell. Remember that, okay? Here's the thing, though. We have already entered it spiritually because the Bible says that the curtain of the temple was rent from top to bottom, exposing the Holy of Holies, and now we have access ourselves. We no longer need a mediator. We no longer have to sacrifice the blood of animals to atone for our sins. He walked in once, and he did it once and for all for everyone. Hallelujah. We're glorified, and we're redeemed back to him, and we're his. Praise God. I'm glad to know that I'm his, aren't you? Amen. Amen. That's just some good stuff, and that will get me fired up. So I'm going to stop right here. So until next time, study on this and forgive the bug incident, wherever that was at. <laughs> I'll be watching this video back just to laugh at that. God bless you, Sandy. Love you.